This is March the 10th, 1956. This is an interview with Mrs. Matcham Galt Johnson. Mrs. Johnson, when did you come to Ardmore? <coughs> In 1890, early in 1890. Who brought you to Ardmore when you came? I came with my father, mother, and sister. There were just two of us at that time. How did you get here when you came to Ardmore? On the Santa Fe train. Uh, when you first came to Ardmore, where did you live? Well, <clears throat> for a short time, we lived in a boarding house run by a Mrs. McDonald that was right across the street from uh, the Santa Fe station. Afterwards, when the house was empty, which was the 700 Ranch House, why, uh, we moved down there. We had to wait for a while until a family by the name of Smith uh, moved out and... Uh, I can remember readily the uh, the night that we walked from the boarding house down there. My father carried my little sister, who was around six months old, and I trudged along to the side of him and thought we never would get there, for it was quite a quite a walk. How old were you then? Well, maybe I, I shouldn't tell, but I was pretty small. Could you tell us something about the 700 Ranch House? <clears throat> Yes, it was located on a, on a high, uh, at least there was a big uh, branch on the north side of it, and it, was, it had three large rooms with a breezeway in between them, where the, uh, it was boarded up in the wintertime and opened in the summer. And the trees along the uh, banks of it were so dense that uh, the sun hardly ever hit the bottom of the creek. And we were, uh, I can remember the uh, Ardmore's birthday <coughs> that year, and they had torches up there for lights, and it was quite an event. Did you go to this event? Yes. My father and uh, had uh, somebody came along and uh, some, some men, and they went along, and he took me. Do you remember any uh, special events that happened at the birthday party? No, I don't, except just the lights, uh, the lights at night, they were uh, torches that were put up, and there was lots of dancing and lots of lemonade stands. How old was Ardmore this birthday? Three years old. Where did you go to school? Well, in those early days, why, uh, we went next door to an aunt that uh, taught the neighborhood children, and later we went to, across the street to uh, um, school to a woman that, whose husband was a doctor, Dr. Ogletree. And uh, later on, we went to an aunt that came to live with us in 1896. And she opened a school down in southeast Ardmore, and uh, the uh, children from just all around came, all ages and sizes. What other additional schooling did you have? <clears throat> well, when the uh, public schools opened, I uh, walked from Carter Avenue to, uh, to Banks Building, and uh, was down there a couple of years, and then afterwards went to uh, the old King Building. School was held there still. And uh, I went to school to a Mrs. Fair, who had, had been a Miss Hope Anderson, and that had taught us, taught me in the fifth grade. Uh, in uh, when I reached the eighth grade, why uh, we went to school to a Mrs. Thayer that uh, had taught us first in the fifth grade, and uh, also went to school to uh, Miss uh, Mary Gwynn, who was afterwards Miss John Whiteman. 
Was there any great excitement that you might have had through the years? Well, they seemed uh, rather exciting in that day and time, for there was so little to go to or to see. The uh, fire of 19 and 1895 was quite a spectacle, and uh, there was no fire department. It was just a bucket brigade, and the whole countryside turned out to do what they could to help. But it was pretty well consumed when I saw it the next day. What started this fire? I don't know. I don't know that I ever heard what did. And another thing, when uh, in those days when there was so little to see or go to, uh, people got to where they laid their clothes out to where they could jump into them pretty easy. And when the fire, when the fire bell rang, of course, after that, why we had it, we we were we had a fire department at that time. Why the whole town and countryside turned out to see it. What did you do for recreation? Well, if you hadn't uh, been to the Sunday school uh, picnic and the fourth, the uh, Ardmore's birthday in July, and had seen Ringland Brother or the Pony Circus in the fall, you hadn't been anywhere or seen anything all year. Did you go to all these events? Oh, yes. We tried to take in everything, because if you missed any of them, well, you knew you were far behind everybody else. Can you remember anything special that happened on these outings that you went to? Well, I wasn't present, but uh, our Miss Jessie Stubblefield, who has just recently passed, and her family, her husband, Claude, and the children were on a picnic one Sunday. And uh, the girls, they had some guests with them, friends of their children. And um, they got into deep water and were in trouble. And Mr. Claude jumped in to, uh, to save the girls, and all three of them were drowned which was quite a tragedy to all of us, knowing them as we did. Was a member of your family connected with the uh, city government of Ardmore? Yes, the uh, oldest brother of the family was John L. Gold. And um, he came up here uh, in um, the early days, well, probably in 89, and worked for uh, Munzenheimer and Dalby in the iron store, which ran from where uh, B.L. Owens is now to what is called D Street, southeast. And um, <clears throat> he worked for them. Later, he went uh, into the cotton business, and uh, he was Artmore's first mayor. And... Uh, Later, why, he was Ardmore's police judge for many, many years. Could you tell me something about the neighborhood you lived in? You said there were quite a few children around there also. That was on Carter Avenue. And within the city's block, there was 47. Most of them belonged to our family. There was uh, the Bruce Hotel in the small Bruce house, our house, the house south of us where the Money Smiths lived, then W.A. Gillum, then the Jonas Bond. And across the street, our uncle, Jim Galt, and his family. North of uh, him was um, a cousin, Ms. Mac Pettit. Next to her was uh, our aunt, Ms. W.I. Smith. Then came a rent house and another rent house, and then next was uh, the Stanley Cox's family's home, and next to that was Uncle John's. And beyond that was what was called a wagon yard lot, 
uh, house where uh, whoever had charge of the wagon yard lived. And uh, in that block, why, it was pretty well filled up when we all got out into the street. Where did you move to from here? We moved up on 8th Street and uh, lived there for, for many, many years. <clears throat> Before living on Carter Avenue, uh, soon after we moved there, and we moved from Carter Avenue up on the, in the unit block on North Washington, a second door from what was called the Wisner Hotel. It was named Wisner for uh, is the middle name of Charlie Carter's father. I think it was the middle name. Anyhow, we lived there for a year or two before moving back to what we call the home place on Carter Avenue. <clears throat> In front of the house was a hard-packed dirt walk and a gully. The wastewater from the hotel was turned into this gully. And after a while, it got to be quite a menace. And one day my mother served notice on my father that we were going to move from there, which we did, and moved back to what we called the home place on Carter Avenue. Did you ever have any jobs as a young girl? <clears throat> well, the first uh, work I ever did was uh, in a racket store on Main Street during the Christmas rush of 1903. Then in 1904, the Weiss brothers had a store down below Dalby's, and uh, I went down and uh, would help them through. I was there, I think at one time, six weeks after they opened. And I'd go down on uh, Saturdays and uh, help out with on sales and things of the kind. I was back strictly in the cashier's box. And uh, among the employees there was uh, Cari Ladd Davidson and Max Bean and uh, the three the three Weiss brothers. Mr. Joe was uh, the head of it. And uh, we were just like one big family. If anybody had anything to eat or went out and got it and brought it in, why, everybody pitched in and made themselves right at home. You were saying something about the confectionery shop is quite a treat for you. Well, we had two in town. One of them was... Uh, run by uh, Mr. Spiegel, I believe it was. He had a bakery and a confectionery. And the other one by John O'Mealy. And uh, to the youngsters who'd never been anywhere and seen anything, why, it was quite a treat to be taken in there and seated at a table and served a dish of ice cream and a soda pop. How often did you ever get to do this? Well, it didn't happen very often. I can remember uh, one time during uh, an election um, when we were all in town uh, waiting for the uh, returns to come in, why uh, Mr. Cullen that lived across the street from us, it was a good neighbor to all the children, he and Mrs. Cullen took about six of us in there and treated us. And it was quite a night. Could you tell me something about the uh, kind of uh, soda pop you had? Was it still the same price as it is now? Yes, it was just a nickel of glass, and it was a pretty good-sized one. But it was made of strawberry syrup or vanilla syrup with carbonated water and a little ice in it. But it was a really a drink if you didn't have one too often. 
Thank you for the interview, Mrs. Johnson. This has been a tape recording by Rosemary Combs, senior in Ardmore High School.